Good morning. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled, Assessing the Impacts of Post-Fire Drill Seeding on Archaeological Resources, a Case Study from the Owyhee Uplands in Southwest Idaho, presented by Kirk Halford with the Bureau of Land Management, Idaho State Office. Before I introduce our speaker, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions or comments for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions box of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field your questions to the speaker after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio box and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Kirk Halford is the Deputy Preservation Officer and State Archaeologist for the BLM in Idaho. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado, Boulder, and a graduate degree in anthropology from the University of Nevada, Reno. He is in the 28th year of his career as an archaeologist and has been with the BLM full-time since 1994. His research focus has been on hunter-gatherer behavior, obsidian studies, and paleoecology. He has a proclivity for thinking out of the box and minimizing minutia, which resulted in the study he will present today. Welcome, Kirk, and thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you, G. Jeanne. I appreciate the introduction. Yeah. So I just I need to I'm gra making... grab the screen and go yep. rock and roll. Sounds good. I'm making <laughs> you the presenter now. Thank you. Well, good. Let's see. Good afternoon if you're in outside of the Pacific. That's right. <laughs> and let's see. Are you seeing my screen? No, nope, not yet. There we go. There we oh, go. we lost it. Okay. There we go. There. Are we good? Yeah, you want to put it in. Um, I paused it. Is that uh, causing the problem? Okay, there we go. Uh, it's in. Do you want to put it in slideshow mode? All right. Yeah, hang on. Let me. Okay. Get, see my. Cooperating. <laughs> you can also use. There oh, we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Great. All right. Let me dock this thing. All right. Good morning, everybody. Like I said, if you're in the Mountain West, you're. It's afternoon. If you're in the on the Pacific, you're still before lunch. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, discuss our our little project, uh, drill seeding project that we conducted uh, in the Owyhee field office in the Owyhee uplands of uh, southwestern Idaho. Um, this is going to be interesting because I've never, I've done a lot of presentations, but never one where I'm just talking to my screen. So uh, this should be fun. <laughs> and uh, we have a whole hour, so this presentation was actually developed for a 15-minute uh, conference presentation, and uh, I told Janae that um, I have this proclivity to kind of wander, so that's a good thing. We have an hour. It won't take an hour. We'll probably spend 20 to 30 minutes and then take your questions. Before I get started, um, what I'd like to do is thank my co-authors, uh, Kelly Barnes and Stacy Gwynn. Kelly uh, really uh, did all the heavy lifting on the field side of this project, organizing crews and getting the needed field work done. And Stacy uh, dealt with me continually for the last six months uh, as I dropped references on her desk and said, read this and see if it fits our study. And uh, so I really appreciate all the work that uh, we've put into this, this project to make it a, a good outcome. Also, uh, the BLM cadastral crew uh, assisted us with the project. Uh, they were a joy to work with and I think they really 
enjoyed working with us and learned a lot. Also, the Idaho SHPO, who was willing to entertain this project, as well as the Shoshone Paiute tribe, uh, who had actually expressed um, concerns about flag and avoiding sites because of the fact that uh, it highlights them on the landscape and we end up having issues with folks uh, going out and uh, doing a little bit of pot hunting. So, And also the ESR folks who were willing to fund the research. When we started this project we had hoped that we could do a contract but as all of you know that uh, are engaged with ESR it's a very reactive undertaking and generally we don't have time to get too many contracts out the door, especially to do the types of study that we were talking about. So we ended up doing it in-house, um, which obviously uh, we, it requires a, a lot of work, but I think we all benefited greatly from the effort. Okay. There we go. So uh, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction about uh, the study area, talk about ESR projects and protocols, discuss rangeland drilling and seeding, and then uh, talk about the pre previous research on the effects um, to cultural sites from drilling and, and other applications and then get into our methods, results, and, and a discussion. So the Soda Fire occurred in the summer of 2015, burned nearly 300,000 acres in southwest Idaho and a little bit of southeastern Oregon. Um, it was proposed to do 20,000 acres of drilling. And ESR, as always, and I know there's a few archaeologists on the phone. I'm sure there's a number of ESR folks, too. ESR folks are probably hoping that this study will like uh, exempt us from doing any further survey. And the archaeologists are probably on the phone because they're like, what are you guys up to? Um, and I think folks from both sides are going to benefit from our study. Uh, um, the study does not part, provide carte blanche, but it provides tools for us to better analyze the effects and understand the effects of drill seeding um, in concert with another, a number of other variables to address whether or not we should be seeding through archaeological sites. And in our case, we're talking about lithic scatters. So uh, we had the fortunate circumstance where uh, we had a model developed for the Owyhee Land Exchange, which incorporated all of Owyhee County, and we were able to go to the SHPO and talk to our tribes about applying that model to focus our inventory on the high and moderate probability areas, as well as a sample of the lower probability areas. So uh, as a result, the, the drills, uh, the seeding occurred in 12 thousand acres, just over 12,000 acres versus 20,000. But as a result, we basically uh, proposed that we needed to do an effect study to corroborate what we sensed and felt. And as Janae said, you know, I've been in the business for 28 years. I've worked on various drill seeding projects. And my impression was when you see the ground, it looks like, oh my gosh, you know, there's lots of damage, but then when I would walk through areas, I would say, you know, it doesn't seem that bad to me. So I never had an opportunity to actually test those those feelings. So that that's, this project was an opportunity to test observations uh, that I had made to see it, what the true effects are. As we all know, um, you know, modern fires, fires today are just, they're, the seasons are longer, they're more intensive. Uh, you know, this fire just burned hot and fast over just a couple of days and uh, 300,000 acres wind driven. Uh, it was just uh, a sight to see. I'm sure I wasn't out there, but I saw it on the news like most people. As we know, um, you know, as a result of the fires, we end up getting cheatgrass and, and Medusa head and other exotics. And of course, they're one of the factors that creates these high-intensity fires. 
So ESR does their best to try to get out there to uh, seed and plant and uh, do whatever they can to bring back some of the native species um, and uh, improve wildlife habitat. And of course this project in particular with the signing of the EIS for the, the sage grouse EIS um, and Secretarial Order 336, which instructs the DOI to improve habitat. Um, this, this project was really on the forefront um, as uh, a project that could be used as, a, as an example or a test case of how we can restore our habitat and bring it back. So we had visits from the uh, Secretary of the Interior, I think she was out here a couple of times, and uh, the BLM director as well. So uh, we've been, this project's under the microscope, so to speak. Uh, so in, in this part, neck of the woods, we generally use uh, drill seeding, um, chaining sometimes, I believe, but uh, my experience has been mainly uh, drill seeding to uh, try to revegetate uh, specific areas. Um, and you can see some examples of the, the drill seed equipment here using range land drills and minimum till drills and you know there's a discussion to be had there about the differential impacts between range land and minimal till but we didn't get into that level of analysis here. Obviously fires always occur in the summer, usually late summer um, and they want to, to drill soon after as soon as the ESR bear plan is completed and the ESR plan is done and generally in the fall is when you need to seed in order to have success so, so you can have that winter moisture. For cultural resources, our general approach has been to flag and avoid archaeological sites. And you know, the, there's a lot of reasons for that and it's not because archaeologists are trying to be obstructionists. It's because we don't have time to actually do an analysis. Um, because these projects happen so quickly, it's, we're in a reactive mode. And so there's really no opportunity to kind of sit down and, and think about the types of sites in the project area or go out and do an inventory up front and, and then categorize sites and then determine areas where you can drill and areas where you might have issues with historic structures or features, cars and, and house pits and things like that that you, we probably don't want folks drill seeding through. Um, so that hasn't really given us too much of an opportunity to really address the effects. And I like this picture because if we look at it, you can see that uh, there's not a ton of uh, impact from, in this particular circumstance from the drill seeding. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, we, we've tend to approach this with the perspective that seeding is going to have adverse effects to uh, historic properties or sites that are eligible for the National Register. Um, and as I said before, there hasn't been a whole lot of research, but uh, there was a paper done by Brian et al. in 2011. Um, it received mixed uh, reviews, mainly from archaeologists because the folks that did it weren't archaeologists. However, their experimental design was a pretty good design, and I think uh, that it was a good study and actually our study has fairly well corroborated what they found. Uh, Harmon took a look at uh, the effects of not drill seeding. Um, he wasn't actually looking at drill seeding but the erosional effects of not drill seeding. And Robertson Landon uh, uh, looked at a mix of different applications uh, just recently. That paper just came out. We got the first copy and we're told not to uh, not to cite it until I got we got the permission. So there it is. It's hot off the press. So what uh, Harmon found was the the failure to actually establish ground cover created adverse effects to sites because of erosion, um, deflation, wind erosion, water erosion, and, and things like that. Um, he felt that uh, the reestablishment of vegetation could 
could mitigate those impacts and the study that uh, Roberts at, and Landon did actually corroborated that. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's a chance, that, and one of the things that we need to consider when we're looking at this is, you know, what are the differential effects to sites? What, you know, other than just drill seeding, you know, the fire effects, the post-fire erosional effects, the long-term effects. And um, so it's, it's uh, a mixed bag of uh, variables that we need to consider when we're trying to determine the effects to a site. It may be better to actually see the site and drill through it and less impact than it is to flag and avoid it. And I think this, our study has shown that that to be the case. Um, as I said, Roberts and Landon, they, they essentially corroborated Harmon's conclusions. Um, they revisited 153 sites at the Milford Flats, which was a huge fire in Utah that burned over 300,000 acres, and they did a full inventory. During that inventory, they recorded close to 800 sites, and they, they used various treatment plans based on the eligibility of the sites. What Roberts and Landed did is they went back to a sampling of the different treatments, and they found that in many cases those sites that weren't treated had more impact than those sites that were treated. So, and here's one of the effects. Um, you know, when we flag and avoid, we end up stranding sites, uh, which gives collectors a, a you know, the green, the flashing light to, uh, there's an arc site there, you know, once they figure out what we're up to, they know what's going on. And of course, we, when we flag, we end up doing it before they drill, and then there are time. you know, sometimes it's difficult to get back out there and remove the flags right away. So you can have a site flagged on the environment for a couple of weeks, and, you know, just a couple of hours of uh, a pot hunter walking through a site, and all your projectile points are gone and diagnostics are missing. So, um, you know, this is a good example of that stranding effect. So as I said, you know, we need, we need to look at the variables um, of the types of impacts that can occur. And our, uh, our local tribe, the Shoshone Paiute, had brought, has brought up to us a number of times that they have been very concerned about the flag and avoid approach. And so they were very supportive of this uh, investigation because their, their feeling too, after going out and, and looking at sites and monitoring, was that the drill seeding wasn't having a huge impact, especially on sites uh, like the ones that we study, lithic scatters. Now if there's uh, ceramics or pottery or Hars with midden deposits and bone and things like that, then the tribe would have a different perspective. But in the Owyhee uplands where we did our study, roughly, I would say probably 80% of the sites out there are lithic scatters, and you don't have uh, hars, and, and most of them uh, are going to be surface scatters. So the study area, uh, it's in the as I said, the Owyhee Uplands in the northern Great Basin. Um, it's a lava plateau, so the soils are essentially uh, very silty and clay deposits. Um, and soils are an important factor in determining, you know, the types of impacts that you're going to see. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But for the most part, what we have are are shallow soils because we've got a, a bedrock substrate of volcanics and um, and then heavily silicated clay soils so uh, when they when they tend to drill seed through that it uh, it uh, doesn't cause a lot of subsurface impact uh, taphonomic impacts that we need to look at are you know obviously deflation caused by wind and erosion and, and other causes. Uh, Biotuberation, which is you know, rodent burrowing and, and things like that, which we see quite a bit of. And argillaturbation, 
And I wish I could have a show of hands. Who knows what argilla turbation is? Okay. Look it up in uh, Webster's Dictionary. No, just kidding. Um, essentially what that is is when you have clay soils like we had, have out here is when you have moisture and it uh, pools up and then dries, you get a lot of that cracking and the soils open up and artifacts fall into the cracks and uh, you know vice versa things get pushed out over time so you know one of the one of the key things that archaeologists have to think about is and you know this has been something that you know as we look at effects determinations you know i've argued this for a lot of my career is that the, the, sur the surface of sites are not how they were left um, they've been affected for thousands of years, and they move through various pro taphonomic processes. So for us to think that when we record a site that everything's where it was left, um, you know, it, it, that's not that's not the case. Sites are dynamic. You know, they they generally stay in a general, con you know, configuration with loci and. Uh, activity areas and things like that, uh, but things move. And so for us to think that they are totally intact is erroneous. So rangeland drilling, um, you can see the type of equipment. This is a, uh, a driller and, and uh, with the disks, and these are separated 12 inches apart. Um, you can see uh, there's a chain. So they cut the soil and then the chain uh, is used to drag the, the dirt back over the seed, essentially. And of course, this is, this is why archaeologists kind of go, oh my gosh, we, sh we can't let them do this. Because if you look at it from just a, a visual perspective, it looks like there's quite a bit of impact going on. Uh, these are a couple of our areas. You can see it was relatively wet when they drilled and uh, um, so we got some clotting. There's also some vegetation still intact and depending on the amount of vegetation and root mass, especially when you got cheatgrass, they have this huge root mass and you get more propensity for clotting and pulling up dirt and things like that. On the on the right, that's one of the one of the issues that we would have is turning within a site. Um, that's when you see a lot more significant displacement of soils when they turn. So if we're trying to uh, create a strategy to seed through a site, we probably want to have some kind of provision that we wouldn't want uh, the drill seeding equipment to turn in those sites. So Brian et al. Um, did their study. Uh, you can get it online. Um, just Google it. I think you can get to it. If not, you can contact me and I'll get you a copy. Uh, they, they set up a, an experimental design, um, you know, a fake site, and planted artifacts in different soil types. So not clay, but silt and sandy soils. Uh, I threw clay in there because that's our environment. Um, but what they found was uh, in the silty clay, you, you tend to get more uh, horizontal movement of artifacts because it's a harder surface. And sandy, less about half, half the amount of movement uh, horizontally, but more movement vertically, vertically because of the soft soils. 30% uh, of their artifacts were buried and 25% were damaged. And, and by damage, it was, most of it was like scrapes from the, the disks and uh, some edge fracturing on flakes and things like that. And, but they did get some breakage, 3.4% was fr were fractured. However, in their study, they actually placed the artifacts in the path of the disks so that they would be hit. So that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind, where with an actual archaeological site, you're, not, you're going to have you know, a random sample, so to speak. Their medium uh, displacement was 9 centimeters, and their mean was 15. So 
So as I, I mentioned this already, the Harmon study, um, and uh, that's one that you can also get online, and I believe uh, it's it's in a publication. Um, he actually went out and placed uh, twenty. He, he did an experiment on twenty-eight sites with with metal washers, so he could use metal detectors to refine the artifacts. And he found that there was very little minimal movement from drill seeding. That most artifacts, uh, if he couldn't find them, they were buried. Um, and so that was his conclusion. And then, as I said, the Robertson land, and they basically concluded that post-fire erosion can harm the surface artifact scatters as much or even more than drill seeding and chaining. Um, so, so, but we weren't satisfied with that. We didn't feel like we had enough research, and so we dug into the plow zone archaeology literature, which there's a ton of it. Um, and uh, you know what we what we were what we found was that uh, their um, analyses essentially corroborated our our hypotheses, which is that uh, plowing has even though on the surface it looks like it's having a significant effect to a site, that it's not as uh, as uh, you know problematic as as we would consider it when we look at it visually. Um, and uh, you know some of these studies have done numerous uh, rep repetitive uh, plowing through sites to test their hypotheses. And generally what they have found is one pass is, uh, has almost no impact to a site. And in fact, uh, quite often what happens is that more artifacts show up after plowing than you originally find when uh, when you, you first record the site. German's study, uh, which was his uh, PhD dissertation, looked at a site along the Columbia River and he uh, shows very well how many artifacts uh, were revealed as a, ra as a uh, result of the plowing versus uh, those getting buried. And you know, you could add, your perspective could be, well, that provides more for pod hunters and things like that. But they, I guess the moral to the story is the sites are dynamic. Artifacts are moving all the time. Robertson Landon, and, and any of you that have done archaeology for any number of years know that every time you go back to a site, you find more, and quite often you can't find the stuff you recorded. So that's just the nature of it. Um, things are very dynamic, and they move around just from one wind event, uh, one cow walking through, or elk, or uh, pronghorn, or, or whatever, rodent burrows, those kinds of things. So this is a study that was done by Yorston. Um, where he actually did a couple of years study, but then he also, based on his study, did a computer simulation. And to show you have a, an archaeological loci concentration of artifacts, and after a couple of passes, it was essentially the same. Uh, and then his simulation showed that it would take about 20 years to disperse the, the concentration and 50 years, you know, it becomes not totally amorphous, but uh, a lot less concentrated. So, so based on that, we felt pretty good that you know our study was going to show that uh, drill seeding was probably not having as much impact as we generally anticipate. Uh, the other thing we have to think about is the impacts of fire, fire intensity. Um, if we don't drill and cheatgrass comes back, then we have another fire. It's high intensity. Um, you know that has its own uh, issues as far as effects to artifacts uh, with spalling and obsidian hydration, losing the hydration rind, and things of that nature. And then, of course, the erosional effects, as uh, Harmon found. So finally getting to our study. 
So originally we uh, recorded eight sites and then uh, the snow came. So uh, we were only able to, to quantify four of them, which is unfortunate. Uh, I wanted to have a pretty strong sample size. We still had a decent sample size, but we probably need to go back and do some more work. So uh, we went out and uh, recorded uh, those, those sites. We used uh, high-end GPS. Uh, we, before we went out, we did, we did hypothesize based on the previous research in the plow zone archaeology that limited displacement damage to individual artifacts would occur and that uh, limited impacts to the overall spatial distribution of artifacts would occur. So we uh, recorded a minimum of 30 artifacts. They, these are sites, these were prehistoric sites that were uh, had been previously recorded and uh, we ran it through the Shippu and the tribes. They agreed that uh, we could use those sites for our, our, our study and uh, so we, we uh, collected the data, we took pictures, uh, all sides of the artifact and um, yeah, and then you know mainly what we had was obsidian, a little bit of obsidian. Most of it was uh, cryptocrystalline silicates, and that should be a capitalized and basalts out there on the landscape. So we drilled them, and uh, then we went back. The other good thing that we were able to do was to do controls. So we had areas where they drilled, and areas where they didn't drill. As you can see, there's a fence over to the uh, right of his left of uh, the, the data collector and uh, you know these sites lap over into those areas and so we were able to, to do a control as well. And then one of the fortuitous things that happened is after we recorded the sites we had a fairly huge rainstorm which was abnormal for our area. Uh, got about close to three inches of rain in the uh, Owyhee uplands over a, a couple of day period and I went talked to Kelly and, and said man I wonder if we could get out there that this would be fascinating to go back to the sites and look at the erosional effects of the rain and uh, so we did and we went back to a few of the sites and replotted and found uh, nothing that was too surprising especially sites that were on a slope there was quite a bit of movement going on. So here's the results of our study of the four sites that we were able to get to. As you can see, what you have is a negatively skewed curve with uh, most of the artifacts uh, on, the, on the left side. Uh, some of them do move quite a bit. Um, we did have one outlier that was uh, over two meters away but uh, the majority of them were less than a half, half a meter and only 8% of the artifacts moved over 10 centimeters. And uh, you can see the median, which is, is the, uh, a more accurate way to view the data. When you plug in the mean, it, because of all the outliers, unless you trim all those outliers, you get a high mean, so the median is a better uh, indicator of um, general tendency there. This uh, scatter plot really kind of shows the picture. So you can see how the artifacts are clustered around zero and underneath uh, below 10 centimeters. And I, I so for every all you archaeologists, pull out your tape measure and look at 10 centimeters. That's four in inches. And just think of the, so that's, that's a level of movement, you know, for 90% of the artifacts, 92%. So it's not a whole lot of movement that's going on there. So if you look at it, uh, you can see there the general tendency is true in the control plots. You've, you've got some uh, movement up to 14 centimeters in the in one of the plots, and uh, the the rain event. Uh, so, it, you know the curves are relatively close to one another, and uh, you can see with the the treated and the control in rain that uh, it's it's not that 
great of a difference, but you do have a few artifacts, again, less than 10% uh, that uh, move uh, farther than 10 centimeters from the datum point. So this is a, a nice illustration of um, the movement at, at one of the sites where we had rain. So the, the green dot in the center is the uh, normalized point from which all of the differential uh, distances are measured from. And you can see the yellow uh, squares are the rain movement and the red triangles are the drill seeding. So you can see there's quite a bit of movement from the rain that occurred um, before the drill seeding actually happened. So it's very il illustrative of the fact that, you know, the, the sites, the surface of sites are not where they were placed when they were created. This uh, shows, you know, from an archaeological perspective, if you're looking at a 10 meter scale, that you can really not tell that there's not much difference between the initial point, which is underneath, in almost all cases, both the rain and the drill seeding application. And then if we actually did an archaeological map um, at a 1 to 1500 scale, you can see that there's generally no, no viewable differentiation. So this is a, a, one of the, the uh, sites that uh, we treated. This is the before treatment. This is the after treatment. And you can see um, because of the clay soils uh, that there's just not a lot of impact. And in fact, and then this was a, a year later, we went back out to the sites to see how they were doing. And you can see that uh, you're getting some revegetation going on in the sites. You can barely see the, uh, the disc scars anymore. Um, and uh, so, so one of the things that um, let's see, I'm going to go back here. I missed it on one of my slides, but uh, one of the things that you need to consider is, you know, when we look at drill seeding, we think in terms of just that surface impact. But if you actually measure the direct direct impact of uh, those discs hitting the ground and then of course the tires uh, which is another thing that we analyzed was the pounds per square inch of impact um, from the different types of equipment but um, with the direct impact from those discs is only about one percent of the site surface so it's not a lot uh, but what you do see is those the discs are angled slightly and um, as they pull across the site, it, it tends to push the dirt up on the uh, on one side, and that that was actually the greatest impact that we saw. We saw very few artifacts that were hit by, by discs, um, but what we did see is they got moved because of the little berm that gets created when the furrow is is created from drill seed. Um, as far as damage, we, we saw no damage, which was interesting. So, but like I said, there was very, very few artifacts were actually hit. And those ones that were, uh, generally that meant we couldn't find, they got buried because they got pulled into, into the furrow itself. Uh, so overall, we couldn't relocate 12% uh, of the artifacts. We didn't see any differentiation in size, but our, our size categories were very small. Um, you know, really not much over five centimeters in size. Um, so, uh, but if you look at the uh, plow zone studies, the, obviously the bigger artifacts, so some studies they've used bricks. So if you add monos and matates and cans and things like that, things that uh, the discs can grab, um, there's going to be more displacement for sure in those scenarios. 
So essentially what we found was that there was minimal uh, displacement of the artifacts, both vertically and laterally. Um, there was no change to the site boundaries and the spatial distribution of the artifacts. Um, in other words, if you had if you had a loci, an activity loci, a reduction area, or biface thinning loci, that it didn't change the characteristics of that, uh, so that you could still interpret that as as what it was. And our study, our displacement was about about half of what Brian fell found, and the reason why is because again we did a random study where he planted his artifacts in the, the uh, right in the direction of travel and and in the the disk line of travel so for us the management implications is that uh, the this drill seating in in the environment that we're working in and the types of sites um, had really no impact to our ability to record and evaluate those sites and their constituents. Um, it, it doesn't change the characteristics of the site that would contribute to a, a site's eligibility. Um, and therefore, there, there isn't any significant impact. And if you did have an eligible property, it would be very easy to make a no adverse effect determination if the site was eligible for the National Register. And, you know, we haven't talked about subsurface versus surface. Um, you know, drill seeding applications are surface applications from an archaeological perspective. You know, we, we tend to think of the surface of sites as the top 10 centimeters, and drill seeding only affects about uh, the top 5 to 6 centimeters of a site. So essentially, you know, if you've got an, an environment where you've got lithic scatters, um, you, what, we're, what we found and what we'd like to do more study on is to further corroborate it, is that uh, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and drill those sites. And, um, you know, because there's got to be actually equal or less impact from drilling than there will be from erosion. And, as shown by Harmon, the erosional effects can be actually higher than drilling. And then, of course, we have the attendant issue of, of uh, you know, pot hunting and things like that. So uh, we concluded that, uh, for sure, you know, in these types of sites, lithic scatters, uh, that uh, drill seeding can occur. Uh, again, we had the the uh, fortune of having a model, not everybody has one of those, that's been tested, field verified, tested and accepted, um, that we could use to define our high, high probability, low probability and moderate probability areas. Um, so one of the things that uh, archaeologists can do and the ESR folks, you guys ought to get together with your archaeologists and look at ways to fund a modeling effort so that when you guys have to apply ESR on the ground, that you can plug that model in and uh, maybe look at ways to um, target your inventory out there. Um, so what we're calling for are similar studies to be done in other environments. Um, we're looking at one environmental uh, ecotone or ecozone, uh, you know, volcanic plateau. Uh, it'd be good to do studies in silty and sandy soils and other environments to further test uh, not only our study but the findings of Harmon and and Robertson Landon. Um, but the the bottom line for us is that. Uh, we need to start trying to think out of the box and do these types of research level projects. And I know it's hard because we're always in a reactive mode, but we need to start trying to be more proactive and look at ways that we can analyze the true effects and be 
you know, have better information for making more informed decisions. Because, you know, in fact, based on some of the studies, avoiding site, we may actually be doing more damage from not drilling a site than we are from, from drilling it. Whoops, that's, and that is the end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, so if you have questions for Kirk, please type them into the questions box in your control panel. Do you want me to leave this slide up or? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I'll put the first one up. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> Um, well, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I have a question. So, um, given the results of this study, how how does it then move forward? Are you now allowed to, can you make the decision to just go in and drill seed, or does there have to be a policy change? How does it work moving forward? Great question. Um, so, every state's different, and each SHPO is different. Uh, perspectives are different. So each state would have to negotiate with their their SHPO. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, in our case, as I said, we had done this uh, modeling effort and in conjunction uh, with the state uh, for a land exchange. And um, so the SHPO was on board uh, with the modeling effort, which was a three-year process that we was tested and vetted. So we, we had that good fortune. Now that we've, we've done this test, we're able to go in and use the modeling in the Owyhee County, not across the state, because we don't have the model across the state, although we've created modeling tools that we can use across the state. So anybody in Idaho, just come talk to me and we can help you out. But um, essentially, uh, now we can make more informed decisions about where to target our inventories and maybe do more sophisticated analysis of the sites that we do record as a result. Um, so, you know, instead of going out doing 100% class three in a, of 20,000 acres, um, as, the, bold, as the, the drill seeding equipment is chasing at their heels, uh, you know, we might be able to get out there and, and target and focus in and do a lot more meaningful and uh, uh, careful recordation of sites. So in Idaho, um, we're in much better shape to make decisions up front and ba based on this study and the modeling that we have. And, you know, the interesting thing is this, this burn occurred in Oregon and Idaho. Oregon's not willing and Kelly Barnes uh, might be able to answer this better than me because uh, she's been working in Oregon recently, soon to come back to Idaho. But um, the Oregon SHPO doesn't, they, they want 100% inventory all the time because their perspective is that drill seeding has impacts. The bottom line for us is that we, if you believe in the studies and you support it and you want to be proactive, and spend more time on what's important versus minutia, then you need to make the case with your constituents that there are uh, better ways to approach how we do business. Great, thank you. And just really quick for um, anyone who might be new to this subject on the webinar, can you tell people what a SHPO is? The SHPO is the State Historic Preservation Officer. They are created under the National Historic Preservation Act, which is the act that archaeologists, Section 106 of the act is the section of the act that requires us to address the effects of undertakings on historic properties, those properties that are eligible for the National Register. The SHPO is uh, created through the act to provide oversight and advice to the BLM. So it's, it's an interesting relationship. It's a state and entity that provides oversight to a federal agency. So when we, when we do a pro, each state has, SHPO has requirements for how sites will be recorded and data collected and how things are analyzed for the National Register. 
And, um, and so every time we do a project, we have to uh, send all our information into the SHPO, talk about the effects of the undertaking, and you know they either concur or disagree with how we've done things. And so, so that's why our process takes quite a bit of time. We have lots of partners, including tribes, that have a very strong voice in cultural resources protection. Great, thank you very much. All right, Aaron Woodard asks, your study noted that no artifacts were damaged during the drill seeding. Did you do a lithic analysis or was it the visual appearance of lithic material? Well, we didn't, we didn't collect anything, so she means did we take them and put them under a microscope? We did not, um, but it was all, so it was all visual in the field. There was no breakage, um, and we took, so we took all the pictures out and the, the measurements and everything out to the field, and uh, there was no evidence of scarring. As I said, most of the artifacts were not directly impacted, and so, you know, 12% we couldn't find, so we can't speak to those. Those were probably the ones that got hit by disks or chained, and, uh, you know, I, I assume that some of those uh, had some breakage. Okay, great, thank you. Daniel Snyder asks, hi Kirk, did you have any funding for this project or was this conducted during the normal course of your work? Thanks and great research. So, that, that's a great question. Uh, and th this is where it gets at to being more proactive versus reactive. When ESR came to us and we proposed that we could use the Owyhee model to focus our inventory. One of the, the, the negotiating points was, but we need to study the true impacts of drill seeding. And so ESR actually put in $100,000 for our study uh, with the anticipation that we would contract it out. Uh, we didn't do it externally, so we probably saved you know, the taxpayer Seventy-five, fifty thousand, seventy-five thousand dollars because we did everything in-house. They essentially paid for our time, but uh, that that was the brunt of it. So, uh, I, I, and I, you know, for those archaeologists and ESR folks on the line, you know, it's just there, there are a lot of opportunities to, you know, think out of the box and do these types of studies. Um, and you know, it's it's tough because in my career, I've talk to ESR folks about doing these types of things as well. We don't, we don't fund research. But the amount of uh, money that it can save in um, doing inventory, because we just don't have good data and we're being reactive, if, if we can build the database, if we can create models, if we can create studies like this and, and build up uh, the database so that we have a better understanding of the real impacts, then we can end up saving literally millions of dollars. So it's just getting creative and being willing not to do the things the way we've always done it and think out of the box a bit. Great, thanks. Um, and just really quick to go back to the last question um, about the uh, lithic analysis. Uh, Kelly Barnes uh, chimed in that it was the, it was a lithic analysis and three photos taken, three photos of each taken to the field. Okay, next question, Aaron Woodard. In the plow zone studies, they noted significant displacement happened at 20 and then 50 years. Was that with one pass each year? Yeah, essentially over, yes, 20 years. Yeah, that's, that's how he did his simulation. So assuming that you drove through the site each year. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Joelle McCarthy asks, how did you involve tribes and consulting parties? Well, tribes, we, up here we meet regularly with our, uh, with our tribes and uh, the Shoshone Paiute, like I said, were really an impetus for this study and uh, very supportive of, of the study. Um, and then, you know, the ESR process of uh, go, going through the environmental assessment and, and doing what needs to be done, um, you know, with, with consulting parties. 
uh, as most ESR work that gets done, you know, it happens so quickly, there's not a lot of time for public input. Um, but, uh, you know, in this case, we felt pretty strongly about our convictions, at least I did, um, that drill seeding really isn't having as much impact as we felt. And so sometimes you got to take some risk. And, you know, people might get angry, and some people are, I'm sure, when, when this paper first came out that we produced, we sent, it got sent around, and I, you know, some of the state leads were getting emails freaking out. People were freaking out that what are these guys doing? Um, but you know, we just we just told folks go read the paper, don't look at the conclusions, read the entire study. <laughs> you know, we're not advocating that we're not drill seeding. We're advocating for better ways to protect sites in the long run. Is is really what we're after. So, great, thank you. Thomas Kearns asks, are there studies on agriculture practices effects on archaeological sites? Yes. So the plow zone studies that I cited, uh, there's a couple of volumes that you, if you go on the web and just type in Google plow zone archaeology or plow zone, yeah, archaeology, you'll come up with um, uh, lots of reading material on that, and uh, you know, so I, I incur encourage folks to look at that. It was very informative for us, um, you know, because that is the most information you can find on the effects of, of plowing um, on sites is is in the plow uh, zone studies. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Natalie Clark asks, Kirk, do you know of any studies that looked at impacts of drill seeding on features, e.g. hearths? Did you document any features on the sites during your study? No, that's a great question. Um, and so here's a caveat with our study is we focused on lithic scatters and sites that were, we, we felt were surface sites, even though we don't believe that there's any significant subsurface damage. We purposely stayed away from areas that we knew were high probability for house features and living floors and things like that. That is, uh, that is something that needs to be analyzed. Um, and that's going to be a little bit more difficult because when you have HARS with bone intact and radiocarbon, uh, you know, possibilities, um, you really don't want to be disturbing those, and so uh, you know. So what we're what we're trying to say is those sites have to be avoided. Um, however, you know we need to look at it. Uh, we we don't know until we actually test it. Um, but uh, you know, I, I certainly myself would be leery to uh, drill through a site that's a residential site that has you know, features and horrors. And, and so, you know, in Idaho, we have kind of a unique situation. And, you know, it's going to be different in every state. You know, you go to Utah, for instance, where you got all the Pueblo and, and New Mexico and Arizona, where, you know, you got you got lots of uh, structural features. I mean, it's pretty tough to drill. So, of course, those sites aren't generally in the bottoms either. They're up in the rock faces and things like that. So you just have to look at all those variables. Um, but one, the thing that we want to encourage and what we're hoping will happen as a result of this study is that it will encourage other folks in other states to go to their ESR folks and start having a dialogue about doing similar studies in different environments and maybe different uh, site types. Great, thank you. And Joel McCarthy has a follow-up to this question. Um, the Roberts Landon Milford Flat study, similarly, no sites were treated with features. Right. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. And, and actually, if you guys want to look at uh, that, that's some great work that got done in Utah. Um, and we got that like really late. <laughs> it, was, it was like hot off the press. Um, but fortunately, we got it. But uh, they did a, a, a really nice study. Um, before the fire, before the, I mean the seeding, um, to, to record sites and then make management decisions about what sites to drill through based on eligibility and what sites not to. Uh, a, a report done by um, Danny McMullins um, 
at Logan Simpson Design, and uh, you guys should be able to get that from BLM. Uh, and then the Roberts study f followed up on that, and that was really uh, as a result of uh, folks like Joel um, and uh, uh, Lauren, you know, that Laurel, that uh, other ar archaeologists in the area that said, you know, let's let's go back out and take a look at the impacts of the treated sites. So, you know, in, in general, I don't think archaeologists and Rightfully so, we're not comfortable yet of saying, "Yeah, just go drill." Um, we're gonna we're gonna be focusing, you know, treatments in sites that are gonna be lithic scatters. But as we all know, <clears throat> in Idaho, for instance, you know, about 80% of our resources are lithic scatters. So, and the houses, the residential sites, they're generally along rivers, and then we have caves, which we aren't gonna drill through anyway and those kinds of things. So our predictability here is a little higher than maybe in some other areas. Great, thank you so much. That looks like the last question. Thank you all for your participation. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey that will appear after the webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon, and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. If you have further questions regarding this or future webinars, please email or call me anytime. Again, thank you so much for attending, and thank you, Kirk, for your presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Everybody have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thanks.